Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Fortress of Comic News, episode 222. I am one of your hosts, Chris, and this week uh, Mike is out of town, so I brought another very special guest host, a host I'm very excited to have on the show, somebody that I have uh, listened to on another podcast for years now. Everybody, welcome to the show, Mr. Todd Roker. Hello, thanks for having me. I guess uh, Joe didn't pick up the phone, so you got me. I'm joking. That's what I always say. That like, because you know, he's the go-to guy, and I'm like, oh, oh, I'll, I'll fill in. I'll be fine with that. But no, thank you for having me on. So, Todd, real quick. Um, well, let me start here, everybody. Our interview this week is uh, Joel Van Patten, who has a really cool book on Kickstarter called uh, Was It Lull? Uh, we're going to talk about that later in the show. So, stick around for that. Uh, but for anyone out there that may not know who you are, Todd. Um, quick rundown of what you do in the comics world. Um, I've been reading comics since I oh got, I don't know the eight, early eighties. Um, obviously I have a podcast with my co-host. Uh, I've been living it for as long as I can remember. Uh, I joke around like, you know, I'm closing it on 50. I remember when comics weren't cool. You know what I mean? It was the, the thing that would get you made fun of in high school, but I, you know, I've been doing it pretty much, as long as I can remember, and I've been proud of it for as long as I can remember. Um, but nothing really special. Just just been a fan my whole life. Yeah, and uh, everybody the podcast, I always recommend if, uh, you know, after you're done listening to my podcast, because I'm always going to promote my stuff first. But when you're <laughs> done with that, um, the one I listen to every week, Longbox Heroes, everybody should check that show out. Right. Thank you. Uh, but what do you say, Ty? Want to talk about the news? Sure. Let's get into the news. All right. So uh, this week we got our first trailer for the upcoming animated series from Marvel called What If? And we know now that the show will debut August 11th on Disney+. Plus. Um, so are you a... Do you watch any animated stuff and are you excited about this one? Um, I don't watch a lot of modern day anima animated stuff. I did back in the day. Um, but I did see the trailer for this, and I and I was always kind of a sucker for what if, but it was more of depending on story, if you get my meaning. Like it's like like what if the Hulk? Some of my favorite stories, are like what if the Hulk killed Wolverine? What if Wolverine killed the Hulk? So I'm more of I'll I will probably watch this, but I'll check them out more depending on like whatever the whatever follows the what if phrase, if you get what I mean. So, but I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I'm also a big sucker for what if. I love the what if stuff. I love that Marvel's bringing it back with kind of their extended mini series what ifs with Spider Shadow and a few more mm -hmm. coming up. I'm really excited for this show because it's going to take on you know Peggy Carter getting the Super Soldier Serum, which is always a fun one, mm -hmm. and a few other. I am a little weird about the animation. Um, anyone who listens to this knows that I get like finicky about animation and how they do it and so i'm not sold on the animation for this but i'll still check it out because at the end of the day story is king um right. and i do love a good what if so I, I i look at the animation and i consider it like a like a, a more of a like a high-tech like flash animation or something i don't know how to explain it i don't know the terms that i'm using but like like yeah i can't i don't know it doesn't I wish Disney would like do old fashioned, like, you know, hand drawn animation for it, but that's definitely not what they're doing. Well, it's like I grew up on Batman the animated series and mm -hmm. uh, in the X Men cartoons and the Spider Man cartoons. Like, the early 90s cartoons was like a golden age for comic right. stuff. And I miss that style. And I think that just because of budgets and everything, yep. you can tell when computers are added into the process. <laughs> right. And that it just reeks of that for me. But. We'll see. I still am going to check it out and still really going to probably enjoy it. So, Me too, probably. Yeah. So uh, th that's really it for TV news this week. <laughs> but uh, did you get a chance to check out Loki Episode 5 yet? Yeah, I, I'm all caught up. I don't go too long after a show drops like that without – because, like, you can't get away from it with the promoted tweets and the all the news sites. Like, this character explained, and there's their picture, and there's, like, their name, and I'm like – all right, I got to stay off Twitter. I got to stay off Facebook. I got to stay off the internet for because I don't, it drops at like three in the morning. I'm like, I'm not watching. Go to work, 
try to do like uh, radio silence and then come home and eat dinner watching Loki. So yeah, I did watch. Uh, so this most recent episode, like we got a lot of really great stuff, including mm -hmm. uh, my new favorite Loki, Loki Gator. Wow. Yeah. Uh, um, and the two things I really wanted to point out on this one, one, everybody saw like the, the Easter egg stuff. And I was trying real hard not to just scream about the Thanos copter mm -hmm. when I noticed it. Uh, so I tried my best to wait till the end of the day to be like, everybody, the Thanos copters in this, <laughs> but yeah. we had that and we had Throg. Yeah, that was a big one, but I actually thought he was Ant-Man for a second. Because it was just happened so fast, and I'm like nearly blind these days, so I had to figure out what it was later. I'm I'm kind of bad with Easter eggs. Like I usually find out afterwards when I go on like comicbook.com. They're like, "Did you mm -hmm. see the Easter eggs?" Uh, the Thanos copter I caught, and I was like, "Did the Thanos copter right. exist?" The MCU, <laughs> and I'm happy. Could die happy now. <laughs> I mean, you can't miss that. That that was so yeah. big. It literally said Thanos on the side. <laughs> But then all of the news afterwards of, like, there's actually a, a filmed fight scene between Throg and uh, Loki. And that Chris, Chris Hemsworth apparently uh, did some audio for it as well. Mm. Uh, that needs to be released now. <laughs> you know what, though? I, I wouldn't doubt if it wouldn't be. Because, like, literally, like, like Disney's different than Warner Brothers. Like, when they want, when, like, when they were, like, released the Zemo cut, yeah. it came out. So there'll be a hashtag. I'm of the school that Disney knows what they're doing. They're like, all right, do this. Let it slip. People will beg for it. We'll give it to them, and then we'll look good. Do you know what I mean? Like, so it'll happen. It'll happen. Yeah, and that's that was going to be my point, too, is that when we wanted the Zemo cut, it was out immediately. So I know we're going to get it. I'm just – I'm waiting now, just, like, mm -hmm. sitting here, Mr. Burns style, like – Come on, bring it to me. Mm -hmm. And I, it's, it would be one of those things where even in today's day and age, I'm like, that'll never happen on a movie or TV show. And that's one of them, like Throg, an right. actual film sequence with Throg, I never thought would happen. And I don't know why I keep thinking these things will never happen, but mm -hmm. I do. And now it's here. Okay. So let me ask you a question then. Yeah. Which would which in your mind before the last episode of Loki Loki was more unlikely likely Thanos copter showing up or Throg? Be, regardless, you got both. Thanos copter, thousand yes. percent. Right, because like you figure that they would adapt the Walt Simonson stuff at some point, and that's kind of cool. But the Thanos copter is so ridiculous. I never thought I'd see it. Yeah. I figure, like, like what we saw in this episode, that we would see Throg as, like, a throwaway Easter egg at some point, mm -hmm. but never, like, something that was filmed, and there's actual sequence with <laughs> Throg being voiced by somebody. Right. Yeah, it's... Uh, so, everybody listening, if you don't want to hear spoilers for the end of this episode, skip ahead, like, 30 seconds. We get to the end of the episode, uh, and a basically a portal opens up. Now, in your opinion, is that Chronopolis? I'm thinking it could be, but um, I'm of the point now that just because there's so many Lokis in this show, everybody's leading towards Kang, I'm thinking the villain's going to be another Loki. Or if not, Richard E. Grant. Like, just, just totally fooling us. I, I, but that's where I am. But... I, with you know the Kang probably appearing in the in the series that it's going to be him. I don't know. I they've gotten me so so many ways. I don't know who it's going to be, what it's going to be. I just wanted to. I wanted to be Latveria. That's all. I'm like Doomstone, but I know it's not that. I saw that thrown around, and I'm just not sure. I, I don't mm -hmm. think they would bring Latveria in this way. But no, no, that'll be a little later down the line. I don't think it's Kang that's going to be the villain. Mm -hmm. But I think in some way this is going to lead to Kang. Because we know that Kang is going to be in Ant-Man 3. Right. Um, so I think that in some way this is going to be like the first time that we either hear the name Kang or just get a hint of like this being exists in this world now. Right. Or they could lay down that it's Rama Tut or Immortus, which are two other, you know, uh, you know, kayfabe names for uh, Kang. You know what I mean? Like, he yeah. was those, 
he was there's a, I don't know, his is one of those convoluted origins. So if they bring that in and then it morphs into Kang, like the the, the real fans would know, but the regular guys would be like, oh, who's Rama Tud? Who's Immortus? So there, like to me, there's like so many ways they can go. Yeah. Well, don't worry, Todd. In a few weeks, we're going to get the Kang the Conqueror miniseries, and Marvel's mm-hmm. going to fix all those problems. So Right. They're going <laughs> to, he has the Hawkman history. They need to clean that up. But yeah. So Loki episode five, I, Really enjoyed it, and uh, I can't wait for the next episode uh, mm-hmm. to see what this, what's going on, what this is all about. So, let's move on to movie news. Uh, first off, this is just kind of a disclaimer for everybody to keep your uh, expectations in check. But uh, it was announced this week that both Disney's Marvel Studios and Warner Brothers DC Films will not be at the San Diego Comic Con at Home event this year. Any thoughts on that? I mean, not really. I mean, it's a smaller con. It's it's the money wise to get people to go. I I don't know if they have, would have time to get things ready. It really doesn't bother me. I'm gonna see how things shake out next year, and that will I'll, if they start going. We're not going to these cons next year. Then that's something. This is this 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 year is just an aberration with everything. So yeah, this year I felt. The DC one I expected because we're getting the poorly named DC fandom again this year. And the Marvel one was a little bit of a surprise, but not too much because I feel like they've kind of they've shown a lot in the past couple of weeks. And like, what mm-hmm. could they really do other than show us another timeline that we've seen like five times? Right. So I, I get it. And it's not one of the. It's not a big event in Hall H like it normally is. So, like you yeah. said, if next year they skip, then I'm my uh, head's going to turn a little right. bit. And I'm not going to knock them, but the only two things they really have coming up are Eternals and uh, Shang Chi, and those aren't for you know God of the Thunder like with Watiti and like you know what I mean. Like if like if it was closer to Spider Man, then maybe. But they're you know they're they're coasting right now until the next couple of movies. Yeah. So, uh, a bit of sad news this week. Uh, everybody, acclaimed filmmaker Richard Donner has passed away uh, last week at the age of 91. Uh, for our audiences here, although Richard has had a vast career, he's probably best known for the 1978 and 79 Superman 1 and 2. Um, your thoughts on Donner and his passing? Um. It's sad. I mean, I liked him as a director. I like, you know, even though it's not cool to, I, I, you know, he went on to do like the Lethal Weapon movies. He did Scrooge, my favorite, uh, you know, one of my favorite Christmas movies. Um, I, I believe, you know, Superman was what it was at the time. I kind of outgrew the Donner Supermans, you know what I mean? Like, um, but you have to give that man credit that he laid the groundwork because there was no real. Uh, superhero film before that that had any kind of accolades. You know what I mean? Like, you want to count the Batman TV series movie that was tied in, but no. But you know what I mean? Like, without Donner and what he did with Superman and with Christopher Reeve and all that, we would not have the Marvel Cinematic Universe that we have today because somebody had to lay the ground. Yeah, it's like you, I respect Donner's work. I'm not a huge fan, although I do enjoy his Superman movies. Um, well, I will say 91, he lived quite a life. So it's it's sad mm-hmm. in his passing, but the, the dude lived, and he lived for a while. Yep. Um, I really enjoyed his story that he did with Jeff Johns and uh, Action Comics 1000. Right. I always felt that he had a love for Superman in some way. And like you said, I you know, the 60s, we had the Batman cartoon. The 70s, you had this. And then the late 80s into the 90s, you had the Batman movies. Other than that, it's like you had the really bad made-for-TV Marvel movies that came out Mm -hmm. during that time. So he was really the one that proved that a superhero movie could be a big-budget blockbuster that everybody wanted to go to. So he will forever be in the hearts and minds of comic fans for that. Yeah. And, you know, he got John Williams to do possibly one of the top five greatest themes in, movie, like, you know, in, like, nerd movie them. So yeah. I'm, I'll, I'll always pop for that Superman theme. Yeah, one they still use today. Exactly. <laughs> um, 
So I didn't have it here on the notes, but uh, I will say, everybody, uh, we're not, not going to talk about Black Widow because, one, it, it just came out, and I don't really like to spoil a movie like that that early. But also, I haven't had a chance to see it, so I don't have much Neither to say I, on the so movie. I haven't had a chance to see it either. So if anyone wants to know my thoughts, and uh, Mike will be back next week, his thoughts as well on Superman, or I'm sorry, uh, Black Widow. We'll have that for you next week. But uh, Todd, we're going to take a quick little break here. We'll jump over to the interview with uh, Joel Van Patten, and we'll see everybody on the other side. All right, we're back. Uh, yeah, everybody, check out the book, uh, the Kickstarter. It looks really cool. Uh, Joel's a really good guy. We had fun talking about uh, the... 2000s punk rock hardcore scene <laughs> talking comics all that fun stuff uh it was great to kind of dive back into my childhood a little bit with him so make sure to check that book out so you ready for some comic talk now yeah we could do that <laughs> let's do it so dc has announced that green arrow and aquaman are teaming up for a seven issue series coming this october the series will be written by brandon thomas with art by ronan Cliquette and Ulysses Ariel. Um, everybody may remember that Brandon Thomas is also writing the Aquaman, the Becoming series, uh, the same month. So looks like Brandon's taken on Aquaman for a while. Any interest in this book for you, Todd? Um, I, I kind of. I mean, I've never read any of his stuff, so I don't know. So I'm always looking for new writers. You know what I mean? So that's fine. But mm -hmm. I am like, you know, I do like Green Arrow for years, uh, and I am an Aquaman fan all the way back to, you know, obviously the cartoon. I have the Super Friends cartoons and Aquaman, but Peter David's run is one of my favorite runs of Aquaman. So uh, it's actually a weird, quirky team up. You know, like you never thought you'd see like Aquaman, Green Arrow. Um, I'm fine with it, and I'll give it a chance. I'll give it a couple issues, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. I think it should be more fun, like the comic they were, you know, created. In, so. <laughs> I'm really excited for this because a, I'm a huge Aquaman fan. Uh, I've got Aquaman uh, page art on the wall in this room. Uh, I've just I've got statues of him. I love the character. Mm -hmm. uh, like you said, the Peter David run is definitely the pinnacle of Aquaman. But there's been some great runs since, and I've always been a like sideline fan of green arrow green arrows had a lot of like sneakily a lot of great creators behind mm -hmm. him uh so you go back to like the kevin smith run the jeff lemire run just in my lifetime and then even some of the stuff in the the 80s that was going on with him so i'm interested in this team up uh it's definitely different mm -hmm. Um, I have read, I believe Brandon Thomas did the Aquaman book for the future state. And if I'm remembering correctly, I, I like that book. So mm -hmm. I'll see what he's got on a, a, a mainstay title. Um, I like kind of the, the header title, um, Aquaman, Green Arrow, Deep Target. <laughs> <laughs> Best of both worlds right there. Yeah, I appreciate the that. But yeah, it's. I'll be checking this one out for sure. It'll be a lot of fun. Right. And I have one question for you: What page do you have? What what run of Aquaman page do you have? Because I'm a stick. I'm a sucker for art. So the page I have is actually, uh, it's from the DC Rebirth Aquaman number one. So when oh, they okay. did the DC Rebirth one shots that one month. Yep. And it's a, uh, it's allowed to hang in my room because. Uh, my my lady likes it because it's Aquaman and Mara sitting at a table having a conversation together. Sometimes they're the best pages, man. Yeah. So I got Aquaman and Mara on the page, and it's just a – it was a good book. And it's yep. it comes off that Jeff Johns run that he did, and it's going back to that same restaurant that Aquaman sat in the beginning of that run. Right. If you read that. Yep, but, I read, read a lot of Aquaman. <laughs> yeah. I love that page. So, this one I'm going to lean on you, Todd, because I know nothing about this character. The human target is returning to DC. Mm -hmm. uh, that is DC Black Label. The limited series will be written by Tom King with art by Greg Smallwell coming this fall. You know anything about the human target? <laughs> yeah, the human target, the basic premise for the human target is you're in trouble. Like, any character's in trouble. They call the human target, and he comes, and he pretends to be 
the person that's in trouble. So if they get attacked, he'll be the human target. Um, so like usually there's somebody like, you know, somebody who wants to kill you or something like that. And that's just, that's the gist of the book. And every month he would be a different reason for somebody to, you know, they had different versions of him over the years. He's been two TV shows that I can remember. I don't know if you know who Rick Springfield was, but Rick Springfield played him in the eighties. And then I believe there was a show in the nineties or two thousand that I, I didn't watch, but yeah, that's the basic premise of the human target. That's a fun premise. I'll, uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, prior to this, I had no knowledge of this character. Um, Tom King's writing it, and I don't know about you, but I've been very hit or miss with Tom King recently. Mm-hmm. Um, but it might be one of those books where I wait for everything to come out and people to tell me how it is. Because I feel like every time I jump into a Tom King book, I end up kind of falling off it because I'm not digging it. I would have to agree. Um, I thought his run of Batman up until like the uh, Doomsday Clock stuff was putting everything on hold. It seemed like so that kind of spun its wheels. Then after that, it just seemed like it's very convoluted stuff that he was doing. Where it was like, oh, it's a very deep, it's very heady. Um, I'm hoping the Human Target is going to be more straightforward, but. It has what looks like the Justice League International characters on the cover. So I'm legally obligated as a fan of that book to buy it just for my collection and then figure out later. I don't know if it's going to be a three issue, 12 issue, whatever, or if they're just in the first issue or if they're in it at all. But that's the thing that piques my interest that I can't not say no. (laughs) Yeah, I'm with you there. Bringing back the JSA. I've been so happy that DC is actually giving that a chance recently. Mm-hmm. Now, this is the Justice League International. You know, the oh, I'm sorry, I'm Justice League International. Oh, yeah, sorry. that's not JSA. They are bringing back too. I'm sorry, yes. I don't mean to correct you, but I, I'm the you know that the Blue Beetle Guy Gardner run soccer firm. It might be the unofficial book of my podcast, so that we ta- that we love the most. Oh, that is. Thank you for that correction, because then I would have he- heard about it later. No, I didn't realize that. That actually kind of piques my interest now. I didn't mm-hmm. even connect that. Uh, well, we'll see. We'll see, everybody. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so as uh, as part of Skybound's new anthology series, Skybound X, Robert Kirkman has announced that the newest Skybound series will premiere in the issue of Skybound X number five. So all you speculators, get your copies. <laughs> and uh, the series is called Code. That's C.O. D dot E dot and will be written by none other than Robert Kirkman with his former collaborator from super dinosaur, Jason Howard. Uh, The series is said to be about humanity's struggle to survive in the far flung future. That is now a technological hellscape. So I know we're going to talk about Skybound X number one later, but are you much of a Kirkman guy outside of like walking dead? Um, not really. Um, I give everything that he does a try. You know what I mean? I tried, uh, what was the one that they ended up having the Showtime TV show about? I like the TV show better than the comic. And then I think Outcast, Outcast was really good. Um, he, what's the one where they were sucked to the, was it Oblivion song? Yes. Or something? Yeah. I, I, I kind of like that, but I just think he pigeonholed himself with walking dead and people aren't going to kind of give them like they want more zombie stuff. Uh, but like I said, because he, I respect him and he's probably one of the biggest independent creators ever. Um, I, I tune him to like Eastman and Laird on turtles. Like he, he pulled himself up by the bootstraps. I'll give him, I'll give anything he does a chance. I did try firepower for 12 issues, but it didn't grab me. Felt like a, like a Shang Chi slash iron fist knockoff. And I was like, not for me, but, you know, three issues, if he can grab me, he gets it. He gets me. Yeah, I have major respect for Kirkman. Uh, what he does for comic shops, mm-hmm. some of the, the twists and turns he gives us as fans. I just, I love it all. It's great. That being said, as you said, not everything is for me. Uh, Firepower, I couldn't get into. Um, Outcast, I was not a big fan of. I really enjoy Oblivion Song, I think more than most people. And I was actually a big Super Dinosaur fan because it was just like fun and a little goofy, mm-hmm. and I didn't have to think too hard about it. It was an all ages title. 
So, I mean, we get a free preview of it in Skybound X number five. So, of course, I'm going to at least try that out. But he'll probably, like like you just said, he'll probably get three or four issues of me seeing if he can suck me in on this one. But I think it looks cool. And I yep. like Howard's art. Right. He has a very stylized uh, art style. So that is it for the news, everybody. Um, and we'll just we'll end up with talking about what we're reading this week. Um, Todd, do you want to start? Sure, I'll start with something that I'm because I've been really loving it, but I don't really talk about it much on my podcast. Is uh, the Swamp Thing book by Ram V. Um, this month it had art by John McRae fam- from working with Garth Ennis on Hitman and everything. Uh, I'm trying to remember what the book was he had recently. It was a uh, Blind Rabbit, I think. Um, but this is. Uh, with everything that's going on, it's a great jumping on point for one issue because basically there's a new Swamp Thing and he ends up, you know, like you don't have to know much about his origin or anything because he gets pulled into the green and sent to London for this thing that's happening. He doesn't understand why. And in the end, John Constantine is there and it's a whole thing wrapped around like uh, this World War II bomb that's unexploded is you know, uh, possessing someone to, to have things done. And it's just that old feel of a vertigo book and the, you know, nostalgia of having a Swamp Thing and John Constantine together. And Ram V really understands John Constantine. And, you know, this is a slightly different Swamp Thing. So, like, I'm enjoying it. But the art is beautiful. Um, just having a blast. Anytime I can see Swamp Thing and, and John Constantine together, I'm happy. Yeah, I've been trying to catch up on that book because it's, been getting praised left and right mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm always so hesitant with swamp thing books because i feel like i'm chasing the <laughs> dragon of alan moore <laughs> yeah there's a high bar for some of <laughs> for for you know swamp thing stories so uh my first book i'll talk about is captain america number 30 uh so my audience knows i've been kind of rough on this uh this most recent run of captain america but uh, Todd, as you are a big Flash fan, I'm a huge Cap fan, so I have to get it just for the long box. Right. Um, but this is the last issue in the run uh, with uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates and Leonard Kirk. And I'll say I, I enjoyed how he wrapped everything up. Uh, I won't give too much away, but there's a great scene of him and uh, Red Skull just sitting and having a, a meal together and how that ties into how Cap ends up defeating... Uh, evil and going on to fight another day is interesting. Uh, I kind of wish we got this level of storytelling throughout the whole series, but uh, I, I don't want to get too much into the negative. I thought it was a good wrap up, and uh, I'm excited for us to kind of move forward with Cap into a new new era. I, I'm looking forward because I want to get back on Cap. I could not get in to this run of it. I tried it way back in the beginning. I always find and his Black Panther too, I found them dry. And I was like, yeah. uh, not for me, you know? Yeah, I agree. I was not big on it, but I stuck with it just because I'm if I'm one of those guys where if I buy something, I'm gonna ingest it. So if I if I buy a drink and I don't like it, I'm just gonna finish the drink because I spent money on it. So I'm going to buy the cat book to put in my long box, but I'm going to at least read it and see what's going on. Uh, I, and that might be weird, but... <laughs> no, I've read a lot of bad Flash stories. Let's put it that way. So, <laughs> But uh, I will recommend, uh, if you haven't checked it out, the United States of Captain America book. Okay. I think uh, Chris Catwell has a better read on the character. And okay. uh, he just kind of jumps into the action of it a little bit faster than this one did. Right. Uh, so I know we both read one book in common, so let's talk about that. Skybound X number one. Right. Uh, what do you think of Rick Grimes 2000? Um, it's fun. It's stupid. Um, it's a continuation. I forget of what issue. Was it Walking Dead 100 where the end was he woke up and it was Aliens, which was the whole gist of how he got the book you know, to greenlit an image. I don't know if you know that story. Yeah. Do you know that story? Yeah. Well, so yeah, so he's like, oh, he put it in the back of the book and he fooled people into thinking that it was, a, you know, real and everything. But this is just that with all, like, you know, a cy- cyborg parts on these people and all the dead characters have come back. And do I love it? Do I think it's deep? Do I think it's, but no, it, but it's, it's fun. And I'm like the idea of it pushing the smaller books 
that are going to be in the backup. Like I'm really looking forward to like the uh, six side cooks of sidekicks of Trigger King is going to be the later one. I like that book, so I know there's going to be an original short story. So this is one of the reasons, like, why I like Kirkman because he's like people will buy this book just because it's got Rick Grimes in it, and maybe you guys will get a payday and eyes on your book. I'm fine. Yeah, the the key word in that was fun, and that's what I had mm-hmm. reading it. Like you got to reintroduce yourself with characters that I love through a what was it three hundred plus issue run, and even TV shows as well in a new light. And it was kooky and weird and fun, and I just I loved it. Uh, I did read. There's a couple of backup stories. I don't read Manifest Destiny or Ultra Mega, so I skipped those. Me but too. they're in the back. They had the first taste of uh, Walking Dead Clementine. Uh, okay. I know you're not much of a gamer, but <laughs> the Telltale video game series with Clementine called The Walking Dead, I really, really loved. And I love that character. So I wanted to check this out, see if I would dig it, because it's going to be young adult graphic novels, which usually means not written for Chris. <laughs> and that's kind of what I got out of it. It was it was written for a different audience, and uh, so it wasn't for me. But I wanted to at least check it out and see if it was something I would enjoy. Um, other than that, yeah, just that book was a lot of fun. Right. What else did you have, Todd? Um, I also had another book that I I always say that I love on the show, but I don't really talk about is Suicide Squad. And this one uh, was a just a one shot. Um, basically, Amanda Waller once again is always up to her, you know, shenanigans using the villains for it. But in this run, she has the clone Superboy of Lex Luthor and Superman under her spell and Peacemaker. But this issue just re- really wraps around how she's using Bloodshot, um, the character. I think that's going to be Idris Elbus in the. Uh, in the, the Suicide Squad 2 movie, is she yeah. sending him from Earth to Earth uh, in the multiverse to see what she, intel she, they, they can gather or who she can end up using for her team? And he ends up running into the, uh, the, the crime syndicate, which I'm wondering if it's going to cross over in that miniseries, but I'm a sucker for the, the crime syndicate. And basically they're like, we don't know who you are, but we realize you're not from this earth and we're going to just break you down and get all the intel on why you're here. And I'm like, all right, uh, super villain, quote unquote, heroes versus super villain, super villains. I'll read that when it happens. You know what I mean? Yeah. So fun book. Yeah, the Crime Syndicate book's been awesome, too. I don't know if you're mm-hmm. reading that. No. Um, I forgot to tell you before we started recording, Todd, uh, the Suicide Squad movie on this show is referred to Polka Dot Man and his amazing friends. That is fine. I'm, I'm with that. <laughs> with the, with the, can we at least say with the Harley Quinn co-feature? You know, sure. like the, the, there you go. Because I'm a, I'm a, I'm a bit of a Margot Robbie fan, just a smidge. Just you know, I get like the Polka Dot Man looks fun. So yeah, Mike and I, when we started the show, were like really big into kind of the goofy, weird side characters that happen in comics, like Polka Dot Man. And uh, mm-hmm. uh, we discovered a character who's now my favorite character ever called Codpiece, who was in Doom Patrol 74 and has never been anything else. But he's literally a, a villain who has a mechanical codpiece that can either shoot bullets out of it or when it wants to, it can have like a fist that has a spring on it. Like, I love that weird, goofy, stupid stuff. <laughs> Sounds like Sex Machine from, from <laughs> Dust Till Dawn. Yeah. Do you remember that with the gun on the, the cod piece? Exactly. Uh, so I also had Avengers number 46, which is the first Avengers coming out of the Heroes Reborn uh, miniseries. And this is the beginning of World War She-Hulk. Mm-hmm. Um, in this, we get the, the Red Guard. They infiltrate Avengers Tower... And they end up kidnapping She-Hulk to bring her back to the Red Room. And they're trying to brainwash her like they did Winter Soldier way back when. Uh, like most of this run, it's he's doing these big bombastic stories that feel like events in every, every five to six issues. And uh, it's fun. And I like having the, the Russian supervillains back. Uh, I, I love where there's a moment in here where... Uh, Dracula is brought back in, and we learn more about his plans with his new 
uh, town that he has in Chernobyl right. and all this fun stuff. So I've been really enjoying uh, that run. Uh, and that's Jason Aaron and Javier Garan doing that. I, I, I read Jason Aaron's run of Avengers in the beginning. And I, I don't know. It just didn't feel like I love Jason Aaron. There was something about it that I couldn't get into. I don't know if it was... You know the the rotation of the characters, and I didn't think he he had it, but I heard it got really good. And the the idea of giving Dracula Chernobyl as a town is just a fat just an idea that I genuinely love. So. Once Dracula got into the mix, that's when it started clicking for me. Like this is a really great book because mm -hmm. like there was that whole war between the vampires and the Avengers, and it got really weird. And then yeah, like Dracula just took over Chernobyl and created a town out of it. And now Blade is actually the sheriff of that town. <laughs> and so it's just like, it goes back to that kind of, that fun, goofy comic stuff that I like. Right, so, right. Uh, what else did you have, Todd? Um, let's see. The only thing else that I really have that I got to read this week, because I'm, I'm so behind too, and I do need to see uh, wa uh, Walking Dead. Oh my God, my brain. Red so I've read so many. <laughs> Black Widow. I'll be all right, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> um, is a book that I'm enjoying is Giger, Geiger. I call him Giger because of aliens. Um, but the main character has now picked up two children that he's guarding from this young king who's really ruling casinos in uh, Nevada after this nuclear war. Um, it's very like Game of Thrones, like with all the establishments, they all have their own like allegiance and everything like that. But we're finding out how, like, who, like, well, how this kid came to be kind of the king and uh, who his father was and why he's after the, the information that the kids have. Um, and it's cool, once again, because you really, I've never really read a Jeff Johns creator-owned project because he's always been Marvel or DC. And I'm a, I'm a sucker for Gary Frank art and post-apocalyptic stuff. I'm down with so I mean, and this is kind of like that Mad Max slash uh, hex in the post-apocalyptic future. I love all that kind of stuff, so I'm enjoying this book. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to read that issue yet, but I'm loving that series. And after John's last two runs, um, being Doomsday Clock and then the Three Jokers, being kind of a disappointment for me personally. Mm -hmm. I was hesitant on this book, but I'm glad I checked it out because it is a lot of fun. Right. Uh, so my last two, I read real quick, is uh, X-Men number one, which is the, the new X-Men series coming out of the Planet Size X-Men, the Hellfire Gala, and all that craziness going on. And uh, while this issue is very deep and there's a lot going on, the basics of it is that the, the X-Men now have a base in New York City. They're back in town. They fight a big bad. And we kind of set up not only a story arc uh, bad guy, but... Uh, more of an overarching bad guy as well. Uh, it's a very hefty book for the $4.99. Uh, it's probably a double size issue. So it's, you know, you get your money's worth in this one. And Pepe Larez, uh, not only one of the funnest names in the business, one of my favorite artists in the business as well. And uh, I recommend it. It's a good jumping on point. And if you want just a straightforward, the X-Men fighting a villain story, this is kind of it. My favorite name in comics history is Bob Budiansky. That's always going to be my favorite name. But when it comes to X Men, I'm so I'm so hard for me to get in. Like I because I, I ran through the convoluted years of X Men. I've always want to put my toe in the X Men pool, but it just seems so hard sometimes. I'm a Kirkman, or, or sorry, not Kirkman, Hickman guy. Mm -hmm. So whenever Hickman dips his toes in something, I check it out, and he sucked me in with this with the. Hox Pox and everything that he was doing. Right. And uh, it's led this far and now keep going. I'm traditionally not an X-Men fan at all. So it's kind of interesting growth for me that I'm like now really big into X-Men. <laughs> uh, and then I'll finish with a image book called Ordinary Gods. Uh, Kyle Higgins is the, the writer here. I talk a lot about his book uh, Radiant Black and uh, people may know him from his DC stuff and everything, but this issue is it's telling two different stories. It's telling the stories of these gods that exist in a different plane and have these powers and how they kind of exist in a almost, like you said earlier, Game of Thrones-ish fashion. 
and they're constantly fighting each other and they're constantly at war and trying to overturn power and all this stuff. But the problem they keep having is that they're immortal. So even when you kill them, they just get resurrected. So they're kind of their battles are endless. And they find a way to put a halt to these these fights by basically seeding Earth with life. And they're able to resurrect themselves into a new body every time they die. So they're actually responsible for the evolution evolutionary chain throughout our planet's history. Right. And then the other story we're told is about this kid who lives with his mom and dad and he has a little sister and he's just a normal guy trying to figure out what he's doing in his early 20s. And uh, he ends up finding out that he is one of these gods reincarnated. He just doesn't know it yet. And that's kind of where it sets up our story of he's not only just a god, he's the god. He's like the king of the gods. And now he's got people coming after him and then people coming to save him and everything. It's a really interesting story and I really liked how they weaved everything together in this issue. I'll definitely be on it for a couple more issues to see where it goes, but I think it's a good number one for people to check out. And uh, Kyle Higgins is a guy that recently has been stepping up his game and I just really, really love I'm not kind of a Kyle Higgins guy. And that one kind of slipped under the radar on me. I liked him on Nightwing during the New 52. I can't think. He had a couple image books that I enjoyed. Um, Radiant Black, I tried. But I kind of slipped off it after they pulled the Southern Bastards on it. Did you ever read Southern Bastards? Yeah, I've read up through volume three of right, Southern where Bastards. The main character isn't really the crux of the story. And then the first yes. one, when it happened, I'm like, this is really cool, but I, you know, I've seen this before a couple times. But I like the story, um, and I then at that point I just have such a pull list that it's like things have to go sometimes. So I got the first storyline, and I thought it was good, but I kind of dropped it after that. I just really liked it. I liked all that, and uh, when we got to the point where it was the Power Rangers moment of all the different suits, mm -hmm. I was just like, okay, you got me. Like I'm of yeah. that age where Power Rangers was a big deal, and right. I was pre Power Rangers, so that really I was like, now if they had turned into a giant robot made of uh, lions, call me. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm a Voltron guy. So, so everybody, that's all we have for this week. Uh, Todd, thanks so much again for doing this. Uh, really enjoyed talking with you. Mm -hmm. If uh, everybody out there wanted to follow you further, where's the best place to send them online? Uh, for the show, it's at Longbox Heroes on Twitter. Longboxheroes.com is the website. Um, my Twitter handle is at, uh, at Roker the Joker, R O W K E R the Joker. Um, we also have a Longbox Heroes Patreon where we do two shows a month, where one is every year revolving like last year we did Babylon Brooks where we discuss the 12 films that Mel Brooks directed. And this year we're doing films where my co-host, I give him something he's never seen and I've never seen. But as a comic fan, my favorite, it's my favorite thing to do. I don't push it because it's a Patreon show. Mm -hmm. um, but it's that we bought a run of Diamond Comic Previews, the catalogs from 30 years ago. We're going through them page by page. What was in previews 30 years ago to the month. And I've been, I've been getting an education and I've been having a blast, like honestly doing it because this was when I was collecting comics. I was at, you know, where all my disposable income went to comics. <laughs> so it's fun. And like literally, like I said, I'm not chilling, but like for a buck a month, it's, it's not bad. But it's my it's literally my favorite thing to do uh, uh, of the comics. Stuff that I do. But yeah, that, that, those are all the places you can find me and my co-host. That show to uh, previewing the past is really cool. And it just it. When you guys announced it, it made me mad that I didn't think of it. Because mm -hmm. it's one of those ideas that's so obvious, but nobody else was doing it. Right. And when it hit, I'm just like, why didn't I think of that? I, I was kind of that way, too, with somebody, I don't know who it is, who's doing Wizard, uh, the magazines. And yeah. It's like, oh, it's just it's just something there, you know, that's, that, that's easy to just take. But it was not easy getting all the copies. <laughs> oh but, yeah. <laughs> So, everybody, you can follow me, as always, at Fortress Chris on Twitter, and you can follow the show at Fortress Comics underscore on Twitter or at FortressComicNews.com. Everything we do is right there on that handy-dandy website. And uh, if you are 
inclined to watch the show as opposed to just listen to it is on youtube.com slash fortress comics uh, remember everybody to do the the five stars on the podcatcher to do the like subscribe share comment on the youtube all that stuff uh i always appreciate it when people do that and uh if you want to go the extra mile we also have the patreon at patreon.com slash fortress comics so thank you all so much and once again thank you todd uh for listening and we'll see y'all here next week. Bye.